Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Sasha Forson. I'm the Assistant Director of BioNebraska, and I'm super excited to welcome you all today to our webinar, Navigating Salary Negotiations. Today's event is recorded and hosted by Nebraska's Women in STEM initiative that our goal is to reduce barriers for women in STEM careers. And this is an in initiative led by Nebraska Cures and BioNebraska. Our collaboration is driven by a mission, like I said, to reduce barriers for women in STEM and to create an environment in Nebraska where these women can flourish, you all women can flourish and thrive in your chosen careers. The contributions of women in STEM are more crucial than ever. And we recognize that the true potential of Nebraska STEM industry can only be realized when it embraces the diverse perspectives and talents of all of its participants. Before we get started with today's webinar, there's a couple upcoming events we would like to share with you. First, we're holding a replenish leadership workshop facilitated by the Women's Fund of Omaha. This will be our second workshop. This time we're heading to Lincoln on September 8th. It's a four hour workshop. So a great amount of time um, to spend. And Amanda and I both participated in Omaha. It goes by so fast. We were like, oh my gosh, this was so great. I feel like we were just getting started. Um, so this is a workshop where you define what your values are, how you want to show up as a leader, and then align those those values with how you're actually showing up. So it it is amazing. Um, no matter where you are in your career, this is an amazing opportunity to lead, whether it's your professional or personal life. Then on October 19th, and we're heading to Lincoln again for our Celebrating Women in STEM Luncheon. This is a luncheon that we've held annually for several years, um, which sort of started off this whole initiative. It, it was kind of like the spark that led to where we are now. Um, this is this will be on October 19th and will also be included as um, bio as part of Bioscience Month in Nebraska. So visit our website, NebraskaWomenInSTEM.com to learn more, to register, um, and to stay up to date on all of our other exciting news and events. Um, so back to the panel. Today we have an awesome panel of women in STEM to discuss a topic that we hear about a lot. Um, so many of you have been interested in exploring how to better better navigate job negotiation. So super excited to be able to facilitate that discussion today. I'll now pass things off to my Nebraska Women in STEM colleague and executive director of Nebraska Cures, Amanda McGill Johnson. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Sasha. I'm excited to be facilitating this panel and would just like to start with a very quick introduction uh, of our panelists. So today we have with us Kathy Anderson, Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at Lincoln Partnership for Economic Development. We have Cheryl Horst, Associate Director and IP Counsel for New Tech Ventures. We have Mary Lynn Munson, Consultant with Empower Up. And we have Aline Warren, President and CEO of ICANN. Um, so for those of you who are joining us live, if you have questions, you can pop those into the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the appropriate time, probably towards the end. Um, but with that, we will start by having each of our panelists briefly share their personal journeys in STEM. And Kathy, we will start with you. Awesome. And thank you, Amanda and Sasha, for putting this on. I am going to share screen real quick. This is a graphic I love from Tim Urban, uh, it's a reminder that our life paths are various. Our career journey might not be a straight A to B. And uh, with my background, these companies and organizations are definitely a case in point for that. They're all important parts of my professional journey. Uh, women in STEM, you know, for me, it started early in middle school. I participated in all kinds of STEM activities like Quiz Bowl, Science Bowl, the Math Club, and the Engineering Club, uh, you know, where we got to build projects, interact with civil and mechanical engineers, and pitch them in competition. And I just mention it because I think it's a really important part of the story, and we should call those things out. So into my career journey, out of the nonprofit sector, I broke into the software development industry. 
Um, I started at a software consulting firm and startup incubator. Um, the position, you know, great entry point, not a great position in general. It had no definition. I was tasked with too many things and didn't have manager support, but I persevered with a combination of necessity, determination, and self-education. Um, can't see participants here, but I, I can see the panelists. Um, who is familiar with the term of continuous improvement? Yes, yeah, generally, yep, head nods. And Stephen Covey's concept of sharpening the saw. Yep, yep, very, very good things there. So yeah, that's what I did. I pursued uh, a rigorous course of growth. I sought out opportunities to speak, to mentor, build, to practice, and to get certified where I could. Uh, so, you know, running a professional network of agile project management professionals, the agile LNK you see there was instrumental to my advancement. And for others in the network, it yielded many new job opportunities. Participating in other activities and networks uh, similarly gave me insight across different, different employers in the industry. And that's key, not just being uh, narrowly focused on your own employer. And then volunteering, um, you know, even internally volunteering to serve on more interviewing teams. That was extra job responsibilities I took on, but it deepened my data set and my understanding of the job market. And then also as part of this picture is the independent contracting I did. And those uh, consulting uh, contracting opportunities provided me both more uh, reps in salary negotiation and more exposure to different employers, different parts of the industry. So that's a quick intro to me. I work at the Partnership for Economic Development in Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And the, that's my email that I can be reached out at and a QR code with more contact information. I'll pass it back. Great, thank you very much. Cheryl, how about you? Great, thank you. I will also share a quick slide that I think helps kind of capture my background. Um, can you see this okay, everybody? Yep. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Well, I would say that my journey to STEM, uh, Kathy, was quite a bit different than yours. As a young child, I was not exposed to science and I didn't grow up in a family that really valued education. So it wasn't until I was 25, actually, that I went to college and I was a first generation college student and um, absolutely had a class, you know, a couple of classes that changed my my entire life and trajectory. So I fell in love with all things that we can't see, uh, microbiology, uh, viruses, bacteria. And so I pursued that path in college, uh, received a bachelor and a master's in bacteriology and microbiology. And I got my first big job after college, right? I was working in this amazing HIV vaccine lab and I still have my original offer letter from that day. Um, I was offered a salary of $34,500. <laughs> and I thought, wow, I've made it, right? I've got this great career. And, and it took about a year in and I realized and became um, very disappointed. Um, you know, I had siblings who didn't go to college and they were making more money than I was. And I had spent six years racking up debt, working all the way through. And, and not only that, more importantly, I realized I didn't love the job. I think similar to what you were experiencing, Kathy, it wasn't a perfect fit, fit for me. Um, I love science, but I didn't love doing science. And I didn't love the nitty gritty of being in a research lab. So at that point in my career, I realized I needed to pivot. And I was fortunate enough to accept an internship with Wharf. WARF is the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation, and they are one of the well-respected tech transfer offices in the United States. Uh, technology transfer is a field that, of course, as children, we didn't ever hear about. It is really a merging of science, business, and law. And once I got involved in that field, I was absolutely hooked. So since that time, I've moved on to um, working in Nebraska at the University of Lincoln for the last 14 years, have loved my time here. I've been able to um, sit for the patent bar, 
went to law school part-time, became a patent attorney, studied with WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization. And I've just really embraced and fallen in love with this career path. Um, so every day I get to come to work and help researchers at UNL try to bring their science to the world and make it a better place. So I will pass it on. Terrific. Thank you so much, uh, Mary Lynn. Thank you for having me here and more importantly for providing an opportunity for others to hear about our views about how we can help each other in terms of negotiating our compensation and even our path in our careers. So my background is I really began um, with a chemistry degree and worked in research for about seven to eight years in a variety of different roles, um, neurophysiology to immunology to molecular biology, working in a protein lab doing molecular biology. Uh, and then I got to work into the commercial space. And I remember um, I'm very lucky to work into like a um, my very first commercial job was just with a fabulous, amazing company. I had no idea how good it was. But I will say that I did a very poor job of understanding my value in terms of my salary when I took on that job, kind of like you, Cheryl, was like, I think it was like less than $30,000. And I thought it was like, oh, wow, this is great. And I made the assumption being in the academic space that the negotiations would be, or that I wouldn't even, I would be treated better than I thought I would, that I didn't realize I had to really negotiate. And I, I remember having a session where I had to do a negotiation and I did terribly, horribly. And I'll tell you, it was a wake up call to learn about how I approached it. And it's been an evolution. And since then I've been able to work into other companies um, in a variety of different roles. Some of them are Illumina, Kaijin, these are probably names that some people know in the biotech space in um, various in, um, international and national roles. And so um, Amersham is another company that I worked at. And so one of the things that, that has been a really important thing is really helping um, myself do a better job of negotiating, but helping others. And so I, I actually spent a lot of energy and effort on one-to-one -one with people talking about what they're being offered and what to consider and really trying to help them um, change that trajectory. And it can be pretty significant what you give up. It can be on the scale of a couple thousand to over 30,000 a year that I've actually helped change for people in terms of their, their position in negotiation. And it, it's not something magical. It's something that they, they all had. It was just a matter of how they, how they saw it and framed it and what they did about it. So that's kind of um, my background. Thank you so much. Great, thank you. And Aline. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Aline Warren and I am the president and CEO of ICANN. And I've been in that role almost, it's getting closer to two years now. And I don't necessarily work in STEM, but I support a lot of, I have supported through my HR career, a lot of people that have. I spent 17 and a half years at First Data Corporation, uh, which is now Fiserv, but a lot of technologists who work for that company. And then also I spent seven and a half years at UNMC, uh, which all of you know have people that flourish in the in the world of STEM. So uh, I think that's what I'll be able to bring to the discussion today in terms of some of my interactions, uh, people who are looking for people in STEM, people who have hired people in STEM, uh, people that are in STEM and uh, wanting to do different things around negotiation. But I would like to say I, I, a little bit of personal information about me. I'm a native Omaha and I was born and raised here. Um, I'm a graduate of UNL. I got my undergraduate and my graduate degrees there. Um, I, feel, I feel very passionate about the work that I do today, which is leadership development. And I've always felt that way uh, throughout my career. I'm married uh, to Thomas Warren Sr. And we have three grown kids and we have two grandkids. So glad to be with you today and looking forward to the discussion. Great. Thank you for bringing that other type, other perspective to this discussion, having been on the HR side of things. 
All right. So we'll go into our next question, which is really kind of laying it out there. I just want each of you to share one or two of the biggest pieces of advice for, for people watching this to consider that have helped you navigate job negotiations. So this time I will start with Cheryl. Great. Thank you. And such a great question. Um, hard to narrow it down to one or two things, but I will try my best. The first one that I thought about is advocacy. So when we go to the doctor, right, we have to have a list of questions and really get answers to the questions that we have and be prepared. And it's the same thing when we take a new position or trying to get a promotion. We have to be advocates for ourselves and for those around us. So this is an area of passion for me. Um, Marilyn, I liked how you talked about the one-on-one -on -one conversations with colleagues and maybe direct reports. I talk about this with everybody in our team here at New Tech. You know, what is what is your goal for your next step? Um, how are we going to get you there? Um, let's let's talk about this collectively. And you know, the thing is, very rarely in your careers is anybody ever going to just promote you, right? It's it never happens that way. A couple of exceptions to that maybe I've seen throughout my career, but it really takes um, you being. Uh, proactive and motivated to get yourself to that next step. Um, and then the other thing I'll say about that is if you fail, that's okay, right? So sometimes we think we're ready for a promotion or we're negotiating a salary at a new position and it doesn't go quite the way we want it to. That's okay. That's a great learning opportunity. You use that information, you ask questions, you figure out what it is you need to get to that next step, and then you have something to work on in the, in the meantime. So advocacy, I think that's just such a huge part of all of this. And then the other point that I'll make is just communicating and talking about this. Um, I, I even, for example, this past year, tried to get my director a promotion, <laughs> right? Because I think it's important. It, it broadens out the ability for our entire team and staff to have room to grow. But I think talking about this, talking about money is okay. That's really uncomfortable for us at times. It is okay to call somebody that is in your industry that you don't even know or to send them an email and say, look, I'm applying for this new position in this industry and I'm just curious, would you be willing to share with me what a starting salary range looks like? What kind of benefit package you're expecting or I should expect? I think those conversations can and should happen more. Um, and with all of that, you collect such rich and great data that you can take that then and make sure you're in a good position when you go in for a promotion or for a new a new job. So I'll stop there, even though there's lots more. I know. Well, we can always circle back and what did we miss at the end? Uh, Mary Lynn. I would say that what's really important in um, so many times when I'm talking to individuals, it's really understanding what is it that you truly want and need and not to be shy about it sometimes we hesitate and we say oh you know I'm willing to take this much but really I want so much more and it's not just about money it may be other things it may be about how much travel it may be about your title it may be a whole host of of other elements but it's really important to truly understand what you think you really want, like I would say, don't put any barriers, just um, go say like, if, if I could have everything I could wish, you know, start there and think about what is it that you really want? And then wrap it into the second part of it is understanding who you're talking to and wrap it into what is it, how does that fit into who you're talking to? So it may very well be, I had a friend who was in, in Asia and she knew um, that it was really hard to hire someone with her her background. She was she was hiring. She was a very very high level, but was in the and she didn't put it into the context that it was be impossible to hire someone like her. So her value and understanding the need that that company needed was so important. So what is it that that company needs, and how is it that um, how does that fit in? And so it's it's also framing it in a way that is understandable to the value of who you're talking to. So are you bringing something that is, uh, uh, you know, it, it's incredibly rare? Do you have some sort of special combinations and things like that? And how does that fit into what you're requesting? So it may be like, look, um, one, of, one of the things I wanna do, I'm completely open to is travel. 
and, and I can make a difference here, here, and here. But what I also need is vacation. So there may be things that you want to think through about um, not only just what you have and what you want, you know, but how that fits into who you're talking to. And so many times, sometimes we get into a mode of we're negotiating something for ourselves, but we don't put it into the context of who we're talking to. So that's those are the two things that I would say as things to consider. There's tons more, as Cheryl said, but hopefully those are two things that are helpful to consider for you. Great. Thank you. Um, Aline. I would build on what uh, Mary Lynn has said. Uh, for me, uh, what I have found that's very important is to brainstorm several different options. Uh, that way you have an opportunity to maybe get something out of it versus nothing. You know, so many times I think people go in with one, that just that one thing that they want. Uh, I think it's really important, like you were saying, Mary Lynn, to know what are a few things that you may want. Have a list of things because that way you can negotiate and you can bargain in terms of if you don't get that one thing, maybe there's something else that you can get. You know, what's that positive outcome that's going to be most important for you and most satisfying for you? I think the other thing to, to remember, and this is very important, it's if you're going out cold and applying for a job or if they're coming after you. If they're coming after you, the world is yours because they want you. So I think that gives you a lot more leverage if you have someone who is actually like a search firm or someone outside of your organization that is saying, hey, we, you know, because that happens, right? People will call and say, hey, are you happy in your job? What's going on over there? And when they want you, that gives you a lot of leverage in terms of ensuring that you can probably get what you want out of that particular situation. The other thing that's very important um, to role play. I know it sounds kind of weird or silly, but that gets you comfortable talking about money. You know, just to role play, you know, if you were in a situation uh, and you had to talk about money. So I think that's really, really important just to get to help you get comfortable with the topic of salary or other things that you may want to negotiate uh, as well. So those are the two things that I would say. Great. Thank you. And Kathy, your your nuggets of advice. Sure. Something that can really help, you know, as the panelists have already mentioned, being ready to ask for what you want. Being ready is also understanding what the interview process is. I've had so many different approaches, like getting a call and being offered the job and uh, right there, the um, hiring manager saying a salary and wanting to enter a negotiation or negotiating via email. I've had that as well. Um, it, if you can get any kind of insight into where uh, the negotiation is going to happen, how you can be prepared, you know, if you know um, in person, you know, various things make you nervous, then that is something extra to role play. Or if you understand that, that the negotiation could um, happen in different ways, then you can be prepared to meet those. Um, so that's that's really important. And uh, even if you can't get exact information about the interview process, which you should definitely ask about upfront as you're as you're applying, you know, tell me more about the interview process. Tell me about the stages. Um, but again, even if you can't get precise information, you can prepare for those those different contexts that might come out of you, come at you. The next thing I want to say is, um, again, I really liked uh, yeah, what Cheryl has said about um, get good data, get good information um, to make yourself confident in what you're asking for and, and to understand where you are. And there are a lot of sources. I really liked the, um, you know, call up somebody in your industry and ask for a range, definitely. Um, there are also, you know, in, in um, uh, in most industry, there are recruiters, and it's not even reaching out to a recruiter one to one. Um, recruiting and, and staffing agencies throw a lot of events. They're very available because that's their role, and you can get to know them and um, you know ask them for some information on your industry. Uh, of course, there's Glassdoor, other sites like that um, that you should get whatever useful information you can. There's also a uh, method of info interviewing. And um, you know that, that's similar to calling someone up and asking them for 
insight uh, when you're negotiating a position or, or ready to do a job search. But anytime you can do informational interviews with people in your field or job roles that you want to go for. And, um, you know, you should be very respectful. You should be very appreciative of their time, you know, buy the coffee, be on time, have a, a uh, prepared set of questions, et cetera. But that's another place where you can really deepen your understanding of how do they hire? How do they interview? How competitive are uh, those roles that you're looking at? What are the job titles? What are the, the details of the total compensation? And um, something else that's maybe a, a little more ephemeral is um, when you deeply understand uh, your company's structure and the uh, forces at play. You know, I know as somebody who has done a lot of interviewing and recruiting, um, you know, if if you understand the budget cycle of of your company and you're you're going for a different role within your company or a different uh, compensation, or somebody asked in the Q and A about um, whether you can negotiate when you're already in contract. Those are really good details to learn. If you learn the rules of the game, then you can adeptly make moves that help get you what you want. Um, and we can't underplay the value of, of your manager. Um, if you are interviewing for a position, you are also interviewing your manager. Make sure to ask them some questions about their perspective and how they want to help you grow and be better in your career and what the um, opportunities are there. All right, thank you. I have uh, one question that's been popped into to the Q&A that I think this would be an appropriate time to, to get some responses to. This deals with people who are already on contract. And so when is it, is it the right time to negotiate before your contract renews or is there other wiggle room? I'll just throw it out there to whoever would like to take a stab at that question. I'd be Go happy ahead, to. Lynn. Having had a lot of people on contract, right? Um, one of the things that there's a couple of opportunities is when there's a major, major win that you've done on your contract can be a, a really timely opportunity to say, hey, you know, we we did this huge milestone. We achieved everything. This is an opportunity maybe to discuss how much further I can help and whether whether the contract really matches what I'm providing or how much more I could provide or whatever it may be that you wanna do that. I, I do think that there's always opportunity. Um, usually every contract has an expiration time frame or an annual period. Um, just like, and I think this is really speaks to not just a contract, but if you're employed and you're having your annual review, prepare for it. Think about what it is that you want. Think about it. And so I think that it's applicable in both those situations that, um, negotiation doesn't have to occur just when you're applying for a job. It's also really important when you're um, through annual reviews or when you're getting a different role in the organization or having achieved a, a very significant milestone that maybe the compensation hasn't really put into, into consideration. So those are all good sorts of areas to consider. So um, this is a great question to ask when you're on contract as well. And it's um, in, and there's different kinds of contracting. So there it may be a situation where you say, I'm on contract and, and I'm really a, a third party and I want to be full time. And so it may be a scenario of a transition that way as well that, that you are considering. And so, or maybe switching to a contracting role and be cognizant if you're not already that when you do consulting or contracting, it's not the same um, wages as a, a um, full-time employee. And that's because when you're on contract, you have to pay for your own insurance, your own taxes. And so the rates are quite different. So be, be aware of that if you are not already, so that you take that in consideration. Any additions, fellow colleagues? You know, I would just add, based on my experience, typically it's, you know, 90 days out that you want to start definitely 90 day, if not sooner, that you want to start that conversation because that allows you some time. If, in fact, you're going into negotiations and you're wanting something different, it gives you some time to go through that process uh, before your contract is over. So that's kind of typically from an industry standpoint, what I've seen. Is it appropriate to actually put it in before you even begin the contract? 
is it appropriate to I would say like um put into the contract hey let's revisit this three months 90 days out yeah I think that's fair or you can just make that agreement outside of the contract depending on who you're dealing with just to say hey at night you know 90 days before my contract is over I'd like to have some discussion with you absolutely yeah, and I'll add one other thing, being in a um, the same organization for 14 years, but having been moved and promoted seven times, I think having little conversations throughout the year and not just at that one point, right, where, okay, we're here, we're at the end of this contract, let's negotiate something different. I think having lots of conversations throughout the course of your time is super helpful, and it it helps you understand what you might need to to actually move it to some different level, right? So I think just having lots of conversations over time instead of like this one big stressful moment where you say, look, I want something different, um, it can be effective. Great, all right. Um, and if anyone else viewing has questions, feel free to put them in that Q&A. We'll be getting to more of those in a bit. Um, for now, um, you know, we've been offering some good tips to folks, but what strategies do you have to conquer some of those thoughts or feelings that might prevent many women from like actually feeling comfortable following through um, with these tips? Uh, Marilyn, would you like to start? Be happy. I'd be very happy to. So one of the things that, that I am a big believer in and that I think that can really be an advantage is having people and networks that can A, amplify you and be a sounding board. And there was, as Aileen suggested about having a practice run, those same individuals can be like, okay, let, let me bounce this off. Mm -hmm. And I think it, um, as Cheryl mentioned, communication, how you may phrase things can make a big difference in terms of your email communication and your personal communication. So if you can create a support network and sometimes it's awkward because it may not be someone you want within your organization but there are I think always opportunities to think about people who are not a part of your organization and maybe in a completely different role in a different industry that having that reliable wisdom and um, and then having consultants and other people who are willing to help out you know one of the things that, that I was suggest telling Sasha and Amanda earlier that I'm happy to provide my email address and to the groups that are registered for this in particular that are happy to give some perspectives and, and help around that. I've done that many times in terms of how to, to look at that. But I think that, um, you know, sometimes we are great advocates for our friends and our colleagues, but we're poor for ourselves. And having that voice of other people can make a big difference in saying, no, what I'm asking for is not crazy. It's actually probably a little too little. And it's reasonable to ask for this and um and getting getting that that support. That's what I would say. Yeah. And I would add on to that that it's very important to have, when you talk about your circle of influence, to have people from all different genders, from all different, you know, organizations. I mean, because you just get different perspectives. But I can remember coming up, I talked a lot to my male colleagues because, you know, for what they had some great advice in terms of how to navigate. Uh, and women, we got it together. We could do it too. We can offer advice. But there's something to be said about also reaching out to your male counterparts uh, to get their their suggestions in, you know, kind of what they went through as well. All right. Um, let's move on to Kathy. Your thoughts? Yes. I love this. Definitely reach out to people, find those sounding boards, those different perspectives that can help you catch even little things, like Marilyn said, like continue to become a better negotiator. There are... Um, it, and and what I'll say about that is I know there are all kinds of resources out there telling you to find mentors and to build your personal board of advisors. And that sounds kind of hard. Um, it, and it doesn't have to be that formal. It, you you really can just mm -hmm. call people up and, and start those conversations. It doesn't have to be a, will you be my mentor? Who's going to be on my board of advisors? There are other sources to get some of that practice and that confidence as well. There's a website called Merit, 
that's getmerit.com. And I've done some mentoring there. I've also had some uh, conversations seeking mentoring. Can be really useful to just book a 30 minute call with somebody um, who maybe has a, a job title that you wanna grow into or who has negotiated something that you're looking at like a contract renewal or a salary increase. Um, that's one. There's another uh, service called 81 cents. And um, even being a reviewer, you can get a lot of experience and you get that into that habit of, uh, I think uh, Marilyn said, sometimes we're really good advocates for others, but not ourself. And I find that as I, I practice that, I get a request in from someone and I reflect on their experience and what they bring to the job and what they're asking in a compensation package. It can really help me feel confident about where I am and what I'm asking for. Um, and, you know, talking about the broad uh, things that we know are true in STEM fields and in general, the, the website is called 81 cents uh, because, um, you know, uh, groups are paid 81 cents on the dollar. Um, if you can keep that in mind, perhaps that can help you fight for yourself. Real quick, Kathy, we had someone ask you to spell out the merit.com or what that full URL was. Can you share that real quick? Yes, I, I believe it's getmerit.com, but I will uh, go find the exact URL and paste it into the Q&A. Perfect. Cheryl. Yes, thank you. Um, a word that popped into my inbox today was verklempt. <laughs> and we should all feel that way. It's this emotionally charged feeling we get when we think about the fact that we're making 81 or 82 cents on the dollar, right? Um, so I love the, the discussion we've had so far about our networks and our inspirational people, having them in our court. I even sometimes go to my daughter, right? She's nine years old. She hasn't had to experience any of this yet. Um, but she, you know, she makes me feel emboldened. I think about her in 10 to 15 years having to go through all of this. And I just, I want to make the world a better place. I want it to be fair for us. So that's one thing um, that I personally do. The other thing that I remind myself all the time is that we don't have to be perfect to be successful. And you both talked about how we're harder on ourselves than we are on other people. And this, I think, happens to all of us. We ruminate on the things we didn't do correctly or right or something we screwed up or we don't, I'm going to say it again, we don't have to be perfect to be successful. So just reminding ourselves that we are humans, right? And we should go easy on ourselves. Um, keep, keep whatever you need, keep a smile file, keep, you know, people have different versions of this, but we have to remind ourselves that we have a lot of successes and we're able to see them in our colleagues and our friends. But for some reason, when we look in the mirror, we see all of the like deficits and the negatives. So we need to flip that. Um, that would be my couple pieces of advice. Any other thoughts that anybody's had on this particular question after hearing everybody? Um, one of the things that Aline triggered for me is the um, not just our networks, but there are people um, within an organization that can be really strong advocates for you. And they are ones that it not necessarily just talking to you, but talking to the organization about you. And so it's, it's, I think that when you have that kind of relationship, people want to help you and that it's okay to have them help you and allow them to be your advocate. So the allies and the advocates, and it doesn't, it, it can be you know, um, men and women, because in, at the end of the day, um, both of them are vital to an organization's success. And so having both, and I would say that it's, it, it could be someone who isn't necessarily, you have your, um, your colleagues, but it can be advocates that are your boss's uh, um, colleague, or it could be someone that's reporting into you or in that, in that bracket. So it doesn't have to be an equivalent. It could be in different places and different, different positions and also different um, men, women, or other, other kinds of of um, types of individuals that could be advocate for you, an advocate. Great, well, we have a, a couple of other questions coming into the Q&A. Um, one is asking essentially, um, 
about the if if you know it's a salary um a raise that you're I'll, I'll read it directly what things should be considered when deciding what you ask for your you ask your employer for how should one decide how much of a raise to ask for if a raise is your goal we've talked a little bit about that mm-hmm. but anybody else want to take that on additionally yeah i would just say that definitely do your due diligence in terms of understanding what the market says understand what your company is paying um, I believe in Nebraska, there's a pay transparency law that there used to be a time when employers didn't have to really share data. But, and, and, it may, and I think it's it depends on your size of your company and that kind of thing. But I would say you have to do your due diligence and have an idea of what the position would pay. And so that may take you a while in terms of you have to talk to a lot of people to get there if it's not very, if it's not in a transparent way. Um, so That's what I would say in terms of just understanding what the position pays, understanding what you need as an individual, um, and and standing your ground. Know your value. I mean, we're all very valuable in terms of what we bring to the table and understanding what your value and and understanding maybe where you can give. And so say if they don't give you exactly what you want uh, at that point in time, maybe you say, okay, well, three months out, I'd like to have some type of discussion about this based on my performance, you know, into three months. So everything is negotiable. And I think, again, it's just having those tools in your tool, tool box and knowing when to pull them out uh, as a part of that negotiation. Um, it was, uh, go ahead, please. It was mentioned earlier, and I do think it's a phenomenal resource that if you know someone who's in HR, or you know someone exactly who is a recruiter, they are really great mm-hmm. resources for compensation and gives you a reality check of what it needs to be. And so, um, and then you may have friends who can share. I think this was all all stated, but um, again, it's really, um, you know, the things I think that people can think about are um, salary, right? And and it, and it may be a scenario where it's um, a sign-on bonus, as another example. Um, there can be like car compensation for some places. There can be scenarios of stock. You know, is it, and now there's a lot of rules and restrictions for each company on stock, mm-hmm. but it doesn't, but there, a lot of companies have something in the back pocket for that availability of it. And so um, it could be, uh, again, less flexible, but it may be like, maybe the company has a, um, a vacation policy that acquire, require, like when you have X number of years, even with a company, you get more vacation and it may be a scenario where you say, Hey, can I be slotted into the five year because of my 20 year experience in vacation instead of starting all over right so there may be something like that so so I think there's some areas because I think the question was what are the different things but it all stems with what's important to you right Mm -hmm. and so if none of those if if there's certain things that are important to you then that's those things that you want to really put into consideration I, I find that sometimes people will um it, companies or, will offer something that you don't care about. Don't say no to it, but maybe use it as a leverage that says, you know, because if they're giving it to you, maybe that's valuable to them or they see it as value. You could use it as a leveraging chip, that's, um, um, chip that says, that is so exciting you offered that. How about um, you know, in um, later on, like, okay, I want this. I'll give up what you offered here for this instead. So those are things to, but there there are many things and it's all really about what is it that's important. To you. Again, there's some people who they want to report into a certain person and they might negotiate that or it may be a title. So those are all things that, that are um, ways to think about of what could be negotiated. Yeah, one, that, one big one right now post pandemic is uh, remote work. You know, having that kind of flexibility a lot. I found that a lot before I left my role in HR, that people wanted that type of flexibility. Uh, in so much, we started putting it in on our job descriptions, you know, if a position uh, qualified for remote work, because there were sometimes, if people knew it didn't, they wouldn't even apply. So I think that's something else that is big right now is that whole um, aspect of remote work. I know I'm a mother of young children, so flexibility for, <laughs> for when mm-hmm. they have time off or whatever is really important to me and where I'm at in my life right now. 
Um, okay, we have a bunch of questions coming in, so we'll try to get through as many as we can, folks. Um, the next one says, can I please ask how you can role play salary negotiations when you don't have much experience in the industry or a recent graduate? So what does that look like for folks who've never done that before? Kathy, I see you put your hand up. <laughs> yeah, I was excited when I saw this question because it can be as easy as ask a friend, ask anyone, uh, even if they are not trained in uh, interviewing or negotiation, you can set them up with a few questions and just having that experience of someone across the table staring at you, asking you a question and you being able to reply like you want to, you know, find multiple people to practice with, but it doesn't have to be complicated. And you can go on Google and look up, you know, what is an uh, interview format or how do I negotiate a salary? And then you can just hand those questions to that person who's willing to take some time with you and do a practice. Great, thank you. Um, next one, finding the right tenor in asking for pay or other advancement can be difficult for women because of bias and unconscious bias. Women can be characterized differently or negatively during the ask. Many women who attempt to negotiate a better financial position are met with, I like you, but we don't have the budget to support an increase. Later, women kick themselves when they hear of others who were successful, many times men. Any advice um, on this front? Yeah, I would I would add here, um, I'm a very data-driven person, so um, I always collect as much information as I can. I rehearse it. You know, you were talking about practicing. I talk to myself in the car and in the shower. I rehearse my pitch, basically. Um, but I also have everything written. I generally will have a conversation about what I'm asking, and I will leave it at, you know, I will follow up in an email with all of the specifics and the details. I highlight all of my accomplishments. You know, so I go through a lot of efforts to present the, the case. Um, and then I give the other person an opportunity to digest and think about it. And, and so there's no opportunity to say no right away, right? <laughs> um, but I think just having all of that information and, and the way I have to do it is I truly have to have it written down. I have to have it practiced. And then I go in and I give the pitch. And so I think just sort of being prepared, being uber prepared in these situations really is helpful. Um, and then giving the other person some time to think about it and consider it. Other thoughts on the bias question and concerns around that? I could add something in a, um, is that it's also about um, knowing your value and articulating that value in the context that they care about. Um, typically, when, when, um, when people are talking about money, then they're not talking about value. Right. And, and what I mean by that is, is that um, the the comment of, well, this is a this is a position that is already established and, and we're not going to go any further. You know, there's been many times where I've talked to people helping them with their negotiations. And that's what they heard. And then it's talking through, OK, does that really make sense? You know, how, how many people have this position, this capability? How if there's lots and lots of candidates, then it's that's probably true. But if it's not, you know, then what is your differentiation? What do you and it's it's um kind of what Cheryl said, it's not only understanding what you what your list of accomplishments, but how is that applicable to the people you're talking to? What is the value that they see? not just the value that you see. So you need to know your value. You need to believe in it, but it has to be in the context of who you're talking to and then being able to hold firm on that and saying, um, yes, this is, I am valuable. And yes, I am what they need and here's why. And and then it, it may ultimately, they may not see it, right? Um, it, it may be that it's a bad fit. Um, that's okay, but it's, it's important um, to put it in the context of, um, are they seeing value with you? The other thing is, is that um, when this happens and you're you're asking yourself, should I take this job because it's not really the the composition I want? It's really important to when I say understand what you want is also understand where you're where you draw the line. Um, mm -hmm. It's called BATNA, best alternative to a non-negotiated agreement. And what that means is, is that 
this is the mistake I made my very first negotiation I did terrible was to say what's my walk away I had no walk away so I gave everything away and so and what happens is you regret it later you say like oh you know it, it wasn't worth it and so it's really understanding and not articulating it to the people you're negotiating with but to understand yourself where do you draw the line where is it so no matter what the industry says no matter what um what they're saying where is it that is a must have and I have to walk away away from this and and then recognize that there are more than one opportunity there isn't just I think when you think this is all you have then you will accept anything right and so and, and the reality is there are more than one opportunity so so um so I those are the couple comments I would say in, in response to um the question yeah all right, I'm going to keep moving through some of these questions. Um, the next one, you get the promotion, the raise isn't what you expected. How do you approach this conversation? Do you want to, uh, to, I don't, you don't want to come off as not being grateful, but you know what you're worth and what you bring to the table. Well, I would say to be honest about it, I mean, to go back and have that conversation and let the person know, hey, you really do appreciate what was given, but your expectations were a little higher. And what can I do to get there? You know, and they may say, hey, it may be three months before I can get you there, six months. But to have, just to have that heart to heart, because there's nothing worse than having something stew inside of you and being upset and not knowing. And sometimes it's just having that conversation and they may be able to provide you some insight. Uh, but I think being honest about it in terms of what your needs are and uh, why it's important to you and how can they help you get there? All right. Um, um, just kind of a comment from one of our viewers that they learned never to accept the first offer. There's usually a 5K margin difference for full-time roles. <laughs> and so, yeah, that some wisdom that's shared by one of our viewers. Um, the next one, can an employer have it in their handbook that you cannot discuss pay with your colleagues within the company? Maybe, Aline, that's a question for you, perhaps. Well, you know? they can. I don't know if it's legal, <laughs> depending <laughs> on how big, how big the company is, right? Because I worked at a company, and it was more um, an unwritten rule. I don't think it was written, but it was a more of an unwritten rule. So uh, I think that's something, honestly, that you could probably do a little research around and find out. Um, because, again, I think it's different now. I mean, I think it's okay to have some of those conversations, like I said, based on some of the legislation that has been passed, uh, even in Nebraska, around salar salary and, and pay transparency. And I would even add that, um, like in California, it's illegal to prevent to prohibit people from talking about compensation. And more and more states are actually um, requiring public postings because of the pay disparity. There are laws that are being put in place in different states. What I see is that there are different laws in different locations, different states. And so it's really good that if you're applying to a particular location, it may not be the same as other locations. And so ch check out the laws um, as, as um, was suggested. You can do a little bit of research, Google sort of scenarios, but but it is it does vary from state to state, but I think it's starting to change. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next question. Um, we're getting more into some personal situations too, but um, this person says they tried to negotiate, but was told that the offer was carefully considered in line with my experience and education and seemed non-negotiable. I learned that another person in an identical position was able to negotiate the following year. Um, it may be gender related. How do I work through this, especially when you really want the job and it is a, a step up from maybe what you're doing now? Any thoughts? Well, I had a lot of those conversations in HR of people that felt that they weren't treated fairly. And so that will be one of my first uh, suggestions is to go to HR and have some of that conversation around how you felt you'd been treated. Uh, HR can will actually look at, they should look into it in terms of salary and what you're making and what the other person got and that kind of thing. Uh, that's if you're willing to do it. Some people aren't willing to do that. They don't want to rock the boat, so to speak. But I'm here to tell you, if you don't do it, it's not going to get done. 
So I'd be an, it goes back to being an advocate for yourself uh, in those situation, situations. And, and it's an opportunity and information so that when you like, um, hey, let's review my compensation. I know others are being paid. Is there certain reasons that, uh, again, how do I get there? I, I think is how you phrase it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, which I think is a great way to phrase it. And yeah. and so um, it, it sometimes, you know, it, there could be market conditions that change. It could be that they're just able to articulate their value more. It could be other factors in terms of the way they are able to look or, you know, there's so many different things that could happen, but there's every opportunity. And this is why we're having this conversation of how do we change that for ourselves here? Yeah. If I can add the other thing that I think is real important, maybe talk to your HR uh, organization and find out if they do equity studies. Really good organizations will do ongoing equity studies to see where people are falling within ranges. Um, and if they find some type of disparity, uh, they they have to correct it. Now, they may, have to correct, they may not correct it right away, but over time, they have once they know about it, they have to do something about it. So that's another thing. Uh, to talk about at your company is whether or not they do any type of equity studies when it comes to salaries. Great. I'm going to try to squeeze in one more question. I think this is a pretty good um, one to end on. And that's just what are the components of a good pitch? We've talked about that. Or what are the things about yourself that should be considered when you're going in to make that pitch um, to that potential employer? Well, I'll start. I would definitely say the why in terms of why you feel that you are worthy, uh, coming in with very concrete examples, uh, coming in with, especially if it's something financial, you know, that, hey, I um, saw this much increase in our bottom line or whatever the case may be, but being able to actually give concrete examples of how you've impacted that company and why you feel that you are worthy uh, for that particular increase, but also like doing some of that due diligence that we talked about as well, because that could come into play. All right. And uh, I don't know, Sasha, did you have any fault, like final questions you wanted to share? Um, no, I mean, I don't think so. I think I appreciate all the attendees for asking really awesome questions. I had sent Amanda a note saying, I want to ask about what happens when you don't get what you want? But a lot of folks already um, asked that. So thank you very much. Um, I will add um, that we believe that for, for the attendees, this is just the beginning of this conversation. We know that negotiation comes up so much. Um, so we know that we're running out of time today and there's still um, some unanswered questions and um, stay tuned because we wanna make sure that we can continue to have forums like this um, to ask questions and how to um, carefully navigate um, negotiation and how to respond um, accordingly. So um, thank you, everyone, very much. The, this has been a wonderful discussion. The expertise you all bring to the table has just been really terrific in your different backgrounds and experiences. So does anyone have any final things they feel like they need to get to get out there before we wrap up? Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, yeah thank you. Thank, thank you to each of you. And for participants watching this, I did just drop a link to a survey in the chat to let us know what else is on your mind or, or how useful this advice you think will be to you. Um, and please continue to, to follow us on social media, check your email for upcoming events. And I will be, we will be making this webinar um, publicly available. So I'll be sending that out through email as well. Um, but we hope to see you at future events um, hosted by Nebraska Women in STEM, including our, our conference that will be in April on April 4th of 2024. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye.